Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the OK Grognard Show. Had a little technical difficulty. Getting started a few minutes late here. It is Sunday, June 14th, 2020, 9.39, 9.40 a.m. Central in beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. It's Sunday, so it's Rules Retrospective Day. We're going to make a few adjustments to what we're doing this morning. Notice things on the fly. We're looking at uh, the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Initiative and Combat Table, the rules compiled by David M. Prada in March of 2006, version 2.2. That he released and we've been going through it we have about halfway through it at this point we've gone through the rules sections of it and we are looking at the actual examples that they put in at the end so we should get moving on that Beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. You know, I'm seeing more and more people around here. And it's uh, it's good that uh, businesses are opening and people are spending their money. I think people should do all of that stuff. I think they should probably try to be a bit safer about it. But in the end of the, at the end of the day, I think uh, we're going to see what we see in regard to that. So what do we get going here? Examples of melee. Yeah, we got. What did we get? We got a. Uh, we got a green screen. We got a green screen, and we've got. And this one. Get to move myself around a little bit. Nice. So here I am, toasty, on the idol. Beautiful background art, satirically used. Yes, satirically used because I'm roasting myself. All right. Good morning. Lost Nomad popping in here. I uh, started just a little bit late, so you haven't missed much. Good morning to you, too. What do you think? We got this uh, green screen thing working now. I just got this last week. I'm working it out the last couple of days, playing with it a little bit, working with some different backgrounds and stuff. Um, of course, there's this fancy one that's all... Uh, I'm coming out of the brazier, aren't I? Right? I thought that was kind of a cool look for me. I was thinking also, you know what I could do? Here's something we can do. We'll try playing with it this way. Um, let me see. There's a way of doing this such that no that's not the one I want is this the one I want no and I'm I'm messing around with something right now but give me just a second while I figure out the best way to do it because there was a hmm this appears differently than what we had before. Oh, I know why. Not to fall. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. No, that wasn't it. It was on this side. And I think was this 
one. This one. No. That's the one. Yep, I'm playing with some stuff that you can't see right now. I don't think it makes any difference. No, I'm not going to be able to show you this cool idea I had. I had this way where, uh, I was going to fade myself in, but it doesn't seem to work any the way I wanted it to. I wonder if this was the one. Nope. Hmm. Well, never mind. I was going to play with something, but now I've wasted everyone's time because I don't have the way of doing it. But yeah, that's me. That is his hands, and they, there's a brazier there. There was a way I was going to try to fade in scene transitions. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to have to play with this more because I think there's this way for me to uh, fade myself in and out. Which would be a cool little, uh, cool little thing to do. Especially since uh, I'd be popping in, fading in into a brazier, right? I don't know. Something to try. Something to try later. But I'm kind of goofy to try it now, I suppose. I'm already here. Yeah, you could do uh you could do a lot of stuff with this. I could I could just be oops, there we go. I could be the entire the entire statue at some point, right? Take the place of the whole thing. <laughs> Blinking in and out like I'm bewitched. Yeah, right? I don't know. Should we get to the rules? Should we get to the examples? That'd be a way to go, huh? Now I have horns. Yeah, I thought about that too. Placing myself this way. We get these people climbing up my eyeball looking at uh, getting my gems. Getting my gems, man. But too big is too big, maybe, huh? Is that about the right size? That works pretty well. Slide myself over just a little bit. I think that works. And we got the rules set up this way now instead of sitting as a uh, as its own thing. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, there we go. Hey, something else I wanted to say over on Drive Through RPG. We've got. Uh, Joe and Susie have an advanced adventures, Stone Sky Delve. This was um, number 11. Is that right? Number 15. AA number 15 says it right up there. This is on sale right now for like 48 hours for $2. And. Uh, you know, normally they're like, I don't know. I think you can get a print version of it for 14 and I think for 7 or 8 bucks you can get just the, uh, just the, what 
exact, exact, exact. <laughs> you, can, you can get just the PDF version. But the PDF version is on sale right now for just $2. And these advanced adventures are uh, Osric modules, right? Um, I think in the in the URL they use some Osric they use I think Gary Gygax book of names is included in the URL so they use some castles and crusade stuff so it's a lot of a lot of troll lords and then Osric all piled in there. I think they might use some monster source from somewhere else, but mostly it's uh, mostly it's about Osric because it's based as an advanced adventure, so it's meant to be uh, usable by people that like that level of uh, D and D, right? Which you know. Should be a lot of people with this show if they see me sitting in the brazier, right? Is that too big now? Should I be even, uh, should I be a little bit smaller? Am I too big for the hands? Is that more like it? I think it wants to snap to a grid here, doesn't it? I don't know. That's pretty good. That'll work. That'll work if I'm in there. There we go. Hmm. Looks like there's some more numbers in the... Oh, we got a new bot. We just got rid of a bunch of bots. And now we're uh, starting to get some new ones. S-R-I-Z bot. I don't know what that one is. We're just going to put it on the, the band list so when it finally gets out of here, it'll be gone for good. I think that's what we do every time we see a bot. We just hit click it as a ban, and then off it goes, and we never see it again. So we've gone through all the rules for this, and um, we're looking now at the examples which start back on page uh, 11. So we're halfway through the entire document. And let's read what it says. A party of good and neutral adventurers is exploring a dungeon. The party includes, and this is uh, pretty interesting, the party includes a cavalier, a paladin, a cleric, a druid, a fighter, a barbarian, and a ranger, all human. Good neutral adventurers. They round a corner and encounter a party of evil marauders, including a magic user, illusionist, thief, acrobat. Let me back that up. I'm skipping a bit of information here. Evil marauders, including a human magic user, human illusionist, dwarven thief. And that should actually be dwarf thief, right? Human acrobat. Dwarf Assassin, Human Monk, and a Human Bard. Surprise dice are rolled. The Barbarian, and by association his party, has only a 10% chance to be surprised. The dungeon does not qualify as familiar terrain. He rolls 69 on percentage dice and thus is not surprised. On the evil side, the monk being 7th level, and thus the whole red party, that is the evil party, is normally surprised 22% of the time. However, the clever cleric had previously cast silence 15 foot radius on his torch. The DM rules that the thus silenced Blue Party, that is the all-human good neutral party, will increase their surprise chance by 1 in 6, 16 and 2 thirds percent. 
This modifier is added to the monk's base 22% chance, yielding a net 38 and two thirds, 39% chance of surprise because we round up. The monk rolls 38 on D percentage dice. Therefore, his side will be surprised. So the evil side is surprised. That second group I read about. Dividing the monk's result, 38, by 16 and two-thirds, and rounding up, we find that his party will be surprised for three segments. Several members of the evil party have reaction adjustments from high dexterity, though, and thus will not be surprised for the full three segments. The illusionist, the thief, and the bard each have 17 decks, so they will only be surprised for one segment. The acrobat has a 16 decks, and so will be surprised for two segments. A D3 is rolled to determine the distance between parties. This is found to be 20 feet. The blue party, I'm going to keep calling them the good party and the evil party. I like that better because hard to see colors necessarily. I need to refer back to them. The good party swings into action. The cavalier and the paladin declare that they will charge the magic user and illusionist respectively. Cavalier at the magic user, paladin at the illusionist. They are both wearing plate mail and move at six inches. Their doubled charge movement is 12 inches or 12 foot per segment. It will take them two of their surprise segments to complete the charge. The barbarian also decides to charge the magic user. His movement is 15 inches, double to 30 inches for charging. He can complete the charge and strike in one segment. So far, so good? All right. The cleric tosses away his silence torch and begins casting another silence 15-foot radiance spell at the magic user. The casting time is five segments. only three of which can be completed during surprise. The spell will take effect two segments into the first full round of combat. The druid decides to throw his spear plus two at the illusionist. The fighter will sip from his potion of invisibility in the first segment. A result of two on a D4 plus one indicates that the potion will take effect two segments later. The ranger, meanwhile, decides to let loose with her light crossbow. She did not have it cocked and loaded, but it's but is still entitled to take her normal rate of fire. Three slash two as she is a specialist in each segment of surprise. She fires at the acrobat. Now we begin to resolve these actions. First, in surprise segment one, the ranger makes her first attack with her light crossbow. She is firing at the acrobat who is AC8, but AC type 10. The ranger rolls an 11. Since she is a specialist firing at point-blank range, she gets plus two. She gets a plus two bonus. She also gets another plus two bonus because she is firing bolts plus two. Finally, a light crossbow versus AC type 10 receives an additional plus three bonus. This makes the final result an 18. As the ranger is eighth level and 18, it's AC8 minus four, thus hitting the acrobat easily. 
damage is 2, 2d4, plus 2, plus 2 for magic. The ranger rolls a 4 and inflicts Fourteen hit points of damage. Hmm. Am I adding that up right? Two D four plus two. Damage is two. Two D four plus two. Plus two for magic and rolls a four. Are they saying four plus two plus two? That's eight. Oh, I got you. Okay, the plus two magic goes on top of that. Reduce it to 12. Damage is two times two D four plus two. Okay. So, d4 plus 2, rolls a 4, makes it 6, times 2 is 12, plus 2 magic on top of that after the, after the effect of the, uh, of the doubling there. Okay, so the ranger rolls a 4 and inflicts 14 points of damage. The druid then throws his spear... Plus two at the Illusionist, who is AC7, AC type 10, actually, though. The Druid rolls a five. The plus two magic bonus makes this a seven. But the minus two penalty for medium range drops it to five again. There's no adjustment for a Throne Spear versus AC type 10. The druid is 12th level and hits an AC 9. Not quite good enough. All right. Two more. Would have been an easy hit, you would think, right? Bad rolling. Tough break. Moving on. The barbarian completes his charge at the magic user. It is AC 10. He's wielding a long sword plus one with a hand axe in his off hand. The barbarian gets to make two attack rolls, one for each weapon. With the sword, he rolls a 17, hitting easily. Damage is d8 plus one for his 17 strength plus one for magic. He inflicts seven hit points of damage with the sword. For his axe attack, he rolls even better, a 19. This causes a d6 plus 1 damage for 4 hit points. The magic user sustains 11 hit points of damage. Now the ranger fires her second crossbow bolt against the acrobat. A roll of 15 for hits, causing another... 8 hit points of damage. At the end of the first segment of Surprise, the Cavalier and Paladin are halfway through their charge, and the Cleric is in the midst of casting a spell. We proceed to the second Surprise segment. As noted earlier, the Illusionist, the Thief, and the Bard, all evil, were only surprised for one segment. So they were on their guard now. In addition, the monk has a heavy crossbow of speed, which he can fire in this segment, despite still being surprised. He targets the paladin. The DM decides that the illusionist, who sees the paladin barreling down on him, will start to cast improve invisibility on himself. The casting time is four segments. So the invisibility will take effect two segments in the first full round of combat. The dwarf thief, who has been hidden from view in the second rank, will attempt to hide in shadows. The bard, meanwhile, 
begins casting heat metal on the entire blue good party. Save the Druid. The casting time was also four segments. Thus, the spell we completed two segments into the first full round. On the good side, the blue side, the Cavalier and Paladin will complete their charge movement. The Cleric is still casting Silence 15-foot radius. The Druid begins casting Bark Skin on himself. The casting time is three segments, so it will be completed one segment into the first full round. The fighter slowly advances while waiting for his potion to take effect. The barbarian continues to attack the still surprised magic user, and the ranger continues firing her light crossbow. Due to his heavy due to his magic heavy crossbow bolt of speed, the still surprised monk fires first in this segment. He rolls a seven. The plus one bonus for the magic crossbow, together with his bolts plus two, make this a ten. However, the paladin is AC type two, so the heavy crossbow bolt takes a minus one penalty. The net result is a nine, which, for a seventh level monk, hits AC seven. The bolt glances harmlessly off the paladin's plate mail. The Barbarian's attack rate of 3 slash 2 is 3 slash 2. So he will attack twice this segment. As his attack routine is with two weapons, he gets to strike twice with each. His first attack rolls are 13 for his longsword plus 1 and 8 for his hand axe. Both hit the AC-10 magic user for a total of 10 hit points. The ranger also has a rate of fire of 3-2, but as she fired twice last segment, she can only fire once this segment. She rolls a 14, hitting the acrobat for 12 hit points this time. The acrobat only had 10 hit points left, so he is now unconscious. The cavalier... Completes her charge against the magic user, rolling a 4. She is ninth level and receives a plus 2 weapon of choice bonus. A plus 1 bonus for her magic longsword plus 1. And a plus 2 bonus for charging. The cavalier also receives a plus 2 bonus with a longsword versus AC type 10. This makes her net result 11, which hits AC1, more than enough to hit the magic user. She rolls a D8 for damage, plus 1 for her 16 strength, plus 1 for magic. The magic user takes heaven 7 hit points of damage. She only had 4 left, so she too is now unconscious. At the same time, the Paladin completes his charge against the Illusionist. He rolls a 3. The Paladin, however, receives a plus 3 for his 18100 strength. Plus 2 for a weapon of choice. Plus 1 for his magic longsword. Plus 1, plus 2 for charging. And plus 2 for longsword versus AC type 10. This totals 13, which for an 11th level paladin, hits an AC minus three. Paladin could not miss. Damage is D8 plus six for strength, plus one for magic. <clears throat> A roll of five equals 12 hit points of damage to the illusionist which also ruins his spell. <clears throat> Excuse me. Since the magic user has fallen, the barbarian wants to make his second attack routine against the adjacent illusionist. 
However, since the illusionist is no longer surprised, he is not vulnerable to free attacks anymore. The barbarian can't engage him, but will not have an opportunity to, sort, to score damage into the first full round of combat. At the end of two surprise segments, the cleric and druid are still casting spells. The cavalier, paladin, and barbarian are engaged in melee. The soon-to-be invisible fighter is closing to striking distance, and the ranger has been firing her light crossbow. On the evil, red side, the magic user and acrobat have been incapacitated. The illusionist is in melee with the paladin and barbarian. The thief is hiding in shadows, and the bard is casting a spell. The assassin and the monk are still surprised. The third and final surprise segment now begins. The illusionist, who will not likely survive the first full round of combat, what with the paladin and the barbarian both wailing away at him, decides to start casting mass suggestion. The casting time is six segments. So it will take effect five segments into the first round. He hopes that the dice let him get this spell off in time. The bard, meanwhile, is continuing the heat metal spell that she started last segment. In the good blue party, the cavalier will attack the still surprised assassin. The paladin and barbarian are still engaged with the illusionist but do not get an opportunity to strike for damage until the first full round, since the illusionist is up on his guard. The cleric and druid are still occupied with their spells. The fighter continues closing at 9 inches. He uh, moves a total of 18 feet in the second and third segments, while the ranger fires her light crossbow at the monk. The ranger, again, is entitled to two shots this segment. For her first attack, she rolls a 17. This should hit the monk without question. However, being a monk, he is allowed a save versus petrification to dodge the missile. The... <laughs> That's always classic. Pardon me, had to clear the throat there. Alrighty. We were at the monk being allowed a save versus petrification to dodge the missile. The monk rolls a three, failing the save. The ranger's crossbow bolt hits for the maximum 14 hit points. At the same time, the cavalier takes the first of her two attacks against the assassin. She rolls an 18, undoubtedly enough, to hit the AC-10 assassin. The damage is only five hit points, though, barely a scratch. For her second attack, the ranger rolls a 13. The monk, again, fails his save versus petrification and suffers another eight hit points of damage. The Cavalier also hits the Assassin again for another five hit points. At the end of this round, the third surprise segment... Sorry, at the end of this, the third surprise segment, the Fighter's Potion takes effect. He is now invisible. Surprise is over, and the first full round of combat begins. Both sides declare their actions. The DM that just decides that. While the illusionist continues casting his spell, the hidden thief will attempt to backstab the paladin. The assassin will strike at the cavalier. The monk will fire, uh, will return fire on the ranger, and the bard will finish her heat metal spell. The players announce that the cavalier, paladin, and barbarian will continue attacking their respective opponents as the cleric and druid complete their spells. 
The ranger will again fire at the monk, while the invisible fighter moves into position to strike at the bard next round. For the first time in this encounter, initiative is rolled. Also for the first time in this encounter, the dice favor the red evil party, which wins initiative 6 to 5. Now, the timing of everyone's actions is determined. The monk with his heavy crossbow of speed automatically fires first. He rolls a 4. This is increased to 7 with magic bonuses. The ranger is AC type 5, which grants another plus 2 bonus for a, to for a 9 total. This only hits AC 7. The ranger is AC 4, so the bolt again glances off harmlessly. The Druid's Barkskin spell takes effect now, improving his AC from 6 to 5. Next, the Cleric's Silence 15-foot radius spell goes off uh, without a saving throw against the unconscious magic user. Ah. Well, this enhances the spell fighter's invisibility, and unfortunately the thief's hide in shadows, it is not quick enough to silence the bard. Having one initiative, the bard's heat metal spell takes effect just slightly earlier in segment two than the cleric's spell. Since the fighter became invisible, he can no longer be targeted, but the cavalier and paladin, both of whom are wearing plate mail, are affected, as is the barbarian, who is unarmored, but wielding metal weapons. On this, the first round of the spell, the metal items become uncomfortably warm. Both the cleric and the ranger are wearing magical chainmail plus one, which is entitled to a saving throw versus magical fire. They both pass the save, and their armor is unaffected by the spell, although they will be unable to draw any metallic weapons. It was determined earlier that the illusionist spell would be completed in segment five. He is being attacked by both the paladin with a long sword plus one and the barbarian with a long sword plus one and a hand axe, subtracting the blue party's losing initiative roll of five from the weapon speed factors, five and four respectively, and treating negative numbers as positive, it is seen that the weapons will strike in segment zero, the very beginning of the round, and segment one, both before the spell is completed. Poor illusionist did not make out so well after all. The paladin rolls a one. Unbelievably, this is sufficient to hit AC1. No official AD&D rule states that a two-hit roll of one always misses. Keep that in mind, those of you who like those absolutes on ones and twenties. Twenties is always a hit. Ones not always a miss. The illusionist suffers ten hit points of damage and loses his spell again. The Barbarian, for his part, rolls a 5 with his longsword, plus 1. He receives plus 1 for his 17 strength, plus 1 for magic, plus 2 versus AC type 10, giving him a total of 9. For an 8th level Barbarian, this hits AC 5 and so causes 6 hit points of damage. The Barbarian's Hand Axe, another 19, inflicts 4 hit points more killing the illusionist. We hardly knew ye. Now, the hidden thief can make his backstab attack against the paladin. Despite the fact that the thief's side won the initiative, the paladin is entitled to two attacks per round, while the thief has but one. Thus, the paladin will always strike first. The red party's luck being what it is, the thief rolls a three, even with a plus four bonus for striking from behind, he still suffers a minus one penalty for using a longsword versus AC type three. 
with a plus four bonus for striking from behind. Still suffers a minus one for long sword versus AC type three. Ah, okay, there you go. The paladin shield is negated because of the backstab. The this totals a six, which for an eighth level thief doesn't even hit AC ten. He misses horribly and is now plainly visible and a likely target for the Paladin's second attack routine. The Cavalier now makes her first attack against the Assassin. Again, since she receives two attacks per round and the Assassin only one, the Cavalier will always strike first regardless of initiative. She rolls an 11 and hits again, this time for a full 10 hit points. The assassin, the assassin returns the attack, rolling a 17. This is modified by minus 2 for a longsword versus AC type 2. The net result of 15 for a ninth level assassin hits AC 1. The cavalier is in plate and shield with a 16 dexterity, and so has an AC 0. The assassin's sword barely misses. She will need to roll an 18 or better to hit. The ranger, who is entitled to only one shot this round, fires at the monk. This time, she rolls a five, plus two for specialization, plus two for magic, and plus three versus AC type 10 for a net result of 12. This hits Ace, the AC five monk, who yet again fails his save versus petrification and suffers 14 hit points of damage the monk is now unconscious. The paladin, as predicted, makes a second attack against the foolish thief who attempted to backstab him. As was illustrated earlier, the paladin cannot miss AC1 or worse, and thus does not even need to bother rolling. He hits the thief for 11 hit points of damage. The cavalier, meanwhile, makes her second attack on the assassin. She rolls a 17 and inflicts nine hit points more. At the end of the first full round of combat, the illusionist is dead, the cavalier is engaged with the assassin, while the paladin and barbarian are simply similarly engaged with the thief. Except for the cleric, druid, and ranger, who never advanced forward, everyone is silenced. The Cavalier, Paladin, Barbarian, Cleric, and Ranger are under the effects of the Bard's Heat Metal spell. The Invisible Fighter is in striking distance of the Bard. The Monk is unconscious at minus one hit point, while the Acrobat and Magic User each suffer one hit point of bleeding damage, leaving them at minus three and minus four, respectively, since they were below zero. Actions are now declared for round two. The DM decides that the magic user, acrobat, and monk will all lay on the ground bleeding, not that they have much choice. The thief and assassin will continue attacking their opponents, while the bard, who is unaware of the invisible fighter, will drink half of her potion of superheroism. The DM rules that she will need one segment to take it from her pouch, one segment to drink it, and a further D4 plus one, three segments before it takes effect. The players declare that the Cavalier, Paladin, and Barbarian will continue attacking their respective opponents. The Cleric, who is outside the silenced area, will cast light on the bard's eyes. The casting time is four segments. The druid will cast flame blade, three segments, while the ranger, also unaware of the invisible fighter's position, will fire on the bard. Initiative dice are rolled, and the blue party, good side, wins four to three. The cavalier fighter, barbarian ranger, are each allowed two attacks this round. Initiative is irrelevant for them, even though they won. The Cavalier hits the Assassin with a roll of eight, causing four points of damage. The Paladin 
automatically hits a thief for 11 points of damage. The Barbarian hits with his longsword plus one, doing another three hit points of damage, but misses with his hand axe on a roll of two. The now visible fighter strikes the bard for a whopping 17 hit points. D8 plus six for 18100 strength, plus three for double specialization, plus one for magic longsword plus one. Let me get right back down to this because I want to point out that the double specialization comes from Unearthed Arcana, page 18. I know a lot of people will know that because a lot of people automatically use Unearthed Arcana when they're playing first edition but I tend to stick with just the three core books so rules like that would not enter into this so I just wanted to point it out so again the now visible fighter strikes the bard for a whopping 17 hit points d8 plus 6 for 18 100 strength plus 3 for double specialization plus 1 for the magic longsword plus 1 Unfortunately, this puts him in the line of fire, the ranger, since the fighter and the bard are both humans and thus about the same size, the ranger has a 50-50 chance of hitting either of them. The DM secret die roll indicates that the fighter will be the target. The blue party's luck continues, however, as the ranger rolls a 1 and misses her ally. The druid's flame blade spell now takes effect. Followed by the cleric's light spell. The bard, however, easily makes her saving throw with a 16, so the light spell goes off immediately behind her. It is now the red evil party's turn to act. The bard's potion of superheroes kicks in. She is a 7th level fighter and so gains 3 levels and 2d10 plus 3, 17 hit points. A roll of 5d4 indicates that the effects will last for 11 rounds, but this is divided by two six rounds as she drank only half the potion. Meanwhile, the thief attacks the barbarian, figuring he is less likely to hit the plate-armored paladin. He rolls a 10. As a barbarian is AC type 10, this is modified to a 12, which hits AC 7. The unarmored barbarian, however, with his 18 dexterity, is AC 2. Not much worse than the paladin after all. The thief does not feel at all good about this. On the other side of the melee, the assassin again swings at the cavalier. As was determined earlier, she needs to roll an 18 or better to hit. She rolls a 15 and misses again. Now the blue good fighter, uh, the blue fighter types, get their second attacks. The ranger, seeing that she's no longer has no longer has a clear shot, will hold her fire. The cavalier hits the assassin for four hit points more. The paladin and barbarian kill the thief. The fighter hits the bard again, this time for 14 hit points, which is subtracted from his temporary 17, the bard gained from her potion of superheroism. Okay. We're close to 50 minutes. We normally do a half hour. As you can see from this, we've got another page. So we're going to fire on through and finish the example before we end today's video. Hope you're good. Lost Nomad, thanks for stopping in. Check it out later on YouTube if you like. At the end of round two, the arms and armor of the Cavalier and Paladin and Barbarian are now hot, and they each suffer a D4 damage from the heat metal spell. The damage rolls are 3, 1, and 3, respectively, this being the only damage they have sustained thus far. The Illusionist 
and the thief are dead. The magic user, acrobat, and a monk each lose another hit point to bleeding, leaving them at minus four, minus, minus five, minus four, and minus two, respectively. The assassin is still engaged with the cavalier and the bard with the fighter. Spells in effect are the aforementioned heat metal on most of the blue party, silence, 15-foot radius on all the melee combatants, and bark skin and flame blade on the druid. The bard will have the benefit of her potion of superheroism for five more rounds. Actions are now declared for round three. The assassin continues fighting the cavalier while the bard will attack the fighter with her broadsword plus three. The cavalier will continue to attack the assassin and the fighter with the bard. The barbarian will drop his hot weapons, pick up the unconscious magic user's staff, the paladin will drop his sword and shield and begin removing his hot armor. The cleric and the ranger will move up behind the cavalier and paladin respectively. The druid will charge the assassin. Initiative dice are again rolled, this time tied, 5 to 5. The DM rules that the barbarian can easily retrieve the magic user's staff in one round. The paladin, however, will need four rounds to remove his plate mail. The cleric and the ranger each take their movement, which is of little consequence to the timing of attacks. The fighter and the bard are each entitled to two attacks this round. Since initiative was tied, weapon speeds are used to determine the order of attack. However, both swords have the same speed factor 5, so the attacks will truly be simultaneous. The fighter hits the bard with a 13, causing 13 hit points of damage. The bard hits the fighter with a 19, causing 10 hit points of damage. The cavalier is also entitled to two attacks this round, and thus she strikes before the assassin. She rolls an 8 and hits for 6 hit points of damage. The assassin only had 6 hit points left, so she is unconscious. The DM allows the druid, who was charging the assassin, can to continue on to the bard. She will strike last in the round. The fighter and the bard now make their second attacks against each other. The fighter hits with a 12, causing 14 hit points of damage. The bard also hits with a 12, causing 9 hit points of damage. As she is less than 10 feet away, the cavalier may also take her second attack on the bard. She rolls a 13, and hits for 9 points of damage. Now the druid completes his charge. Unfortunately, he rolls a plus 2. Uh, he rolls a 3. The plus 2 bonus for charging makes us a 5. However, the flame blade is treated as a scimitar, which has a minus 1 penalty against the bard's AC type of 5. The druid's net result of 4 misses. The arms and armor of the Cavalier and the Paladin are now searing, and they each suffer 2d4 damage from the heat metal spell. The rolls are 8 and 6. The Cavalier, who is still in her helmet, passes out. The Paladin, who would have removed his helmet first, does not pass out, but they will both be disabled for 1d4 days from the burns. Finally, thinks the bard. At the end of round three, only the bard remains active on the red side, the evil side. She is engaged with the fighter and the druid. The unconscious magic user, acrobat, monk, each lose another hit point, bringing them down to minus six, minus five, and minus three, respectively. The cavalier and paladin are down on the blue side, and the cleric, ranger, and barbarian standing nearby. Actions are declared for round four. The bard bard will fight on. The cleric will help the fallen cavalier out of her armor while the ranger does the same for the paladin. The barbarian will close with the bard while the fighter and druid continue to attack. Initiative is rolled and the bard wins 3-2. to two. However, the bard's attack rate is 3-2 and she only has one attack this round. Therefore, the fighter with a 2-1 is allowed to strike first. He rolls a 17 and hits for 15 hit points of damage. The bard returns the attack. She hits with an 18, but only does 5 hit points of damage. 
Then the druid attacks, but alas, he rolls a one and misses completely. The fighter's second attack, though, is a ten, for which seventeen hit points, and kills the bard. The melee is over. Well, that's a lot. We will look next time at this table for tied D6 rolls, which will be interesting to check out. We will also look at high D6 versus low D6 roll. Just to get a feel for how those tables work and see if they can help speed some things up. We'll talk a bit about attack routines and how they figure in and discuss the sources if we get all that next time I'd be surprised it'll probably be two more videos on this subject here so I want to thank everybody who's come by Lost Nomad anybody else Lexfire anybody else hanging out in the Twitch channel thanks be sure to follow if you speak up it is a new week, so if you're popping into the chat, make sure you speak up and get in on the drawing. There will be a drawing tomorrow, obviously. Uh, let us not forget, we want to make an adjustment here on this, and we want to go back over to that so we can say, Thank you very much. Also, don't forget, Harry House a Day coming up Monday, June 29th. That's just a couple of weeks away. The rest of the schedule for this week. Tomorrow, weekly news and the giveaway. We will uh, figure out exactly what we're giving away. Got to do that soon because tomorrow is when we make the announcement. So we've got to check it out today. Cartography and world building on Tuesday campaign discussion on Wednesday, more of my Grimbald stuff, painting and crafting, Thursday, Friday, building virtual tabletop adventures, another DM cartoon review, episode four of the Conan the Adventurer animated series is on the docket, and then background to the rules retrospective on next Sunday. Once again, thanks everybody that was in the following along in the Twitch channel today. Always speak up when you're here, because if you do so in the live stream chat, you'll be automatically added in for the weekly drawing. If you're catching up on this uh, in YouTube, thank you very much. Subscribe to that channel so you always get notifications when a new when the uh, new episodes are posted. They're usually right on the heels of when we do them. And uh, give us a thumbs up, make a comment, give us some feedback. Appreciate it very much, everybody who's come by today and stopped in. And I thank you all, and we'll catch you later in the week. Bye-bye.